Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Stay Current podcast. I'm Cecilia Higiena from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and along with Stay Current, we are sharing knowledge to improve child health around the globe. Today, we are going to talk about duodenal obstruction, and for that, we have Dr. Juan Gurria. I'm Juan Gurria. I'm one of the assistant professors in surgery at Cincinnati Children's, currently the director of the Surgical Critical Care Fellowship. We are going to talk about definition, epidemiology, pathophysiology, associated anomalies, clinical manifestation, diagnosis, treatment, complications, and polo. So if you're looking for something specific, make sure to check the time steps in the description. They will take you wherever you need. So let's start by the definition. And, you know, it comes in a very degree of obstruction, depending whether it's a complete or a partially obstructed intestine, depending on whether it's an intrinsic lesion causing the problem or an extrinsic lesion causing the problem. So for duodenal obstructions, we have complete obstructions or partial obstructions. And within them, they can be intrinsic causes or extrinsic causes. But how does this occur? Duodenum starts with a proliferation of the epithelium and then it happens through a recanalization process in the lumen. Okay, there's a important concept here which is called vacualization of this lumen. And when it's defective, it's going to cause any type of obstruction. Okay, duodenal stenosis can happen, which it's in small lumen, usually in the third or fourth portion of the duodenum, all the way to duodenal atresia, which is a totally occluded lumen, usually also in the second or third part of the duodenum. It is important to know and understand that it's an epithelial apoptosis problem, as opposed to distal intestinal atresia. So the problems in recanalization are considered to be the primary causes of duodenal atresia. And for classifying it, we use the Gray and Scandalakis classifications, which has three types. Type 1. A complete duodenal membrane appears as a normal duodenum from the outside, but there's a membrane on the inside. This membrane could be complete or perforated, and it can also act like a, the classic windsock deformity. Type 2. Both duodenal ends are atresic separated but some distance but attached by a cord and the mesentery is intact type 3 is the duodenal urns are atresic but they are separated by some distance without any tissue intervening and the mesentery has a v-shaped effect but you can also have some extrinsic causes usually due to a thing called annular pancreas but also can happen from a pre portal vein Speaking of annular pancreas, we understand that when the pancreas is developing, the ventral bod fails to rotate posteriorly to join this dorsal bod. So it, it continues to be wrapped around the duodenum, causing an extrinsic compression. However, we need to understand that there's almost always an associated intrinsic anomaly to this duodenum. Great. And how common is the duodenum structure? You know, the Dina Tricia usually happens in one to 7,000 or so to up to one in 40,000 alive birds. And it counts almost to like half of the intestinal atresias that present to us in pediatric surgery. So now that we know what it is and its pathophysiology, let's talk about associated anomalies. Speaking about associated congenital anomalies, it's important to understand that these patients can present with up to 50% of associated anomalies. And it's important because most of them, up to 35%, will have a cardiac defect. But cardiac defects are not the only associated anomalies they can have. Trisomy 21 occurs in up to 30% of patients with duodenal atresia, not so much the other way around. Importantly, up to 30% can have malrotation. Up to 15% of these patients can have esophageal nutrition DF, and also up to 10% anorectal anomalies. In rare cases, you can also see intestinal duplications, atrotaxy, polyosplenia. In very rare, but biliary atresia can happen as, as well. And how does a duodenal atresia typically present? These patients usually have a PO tolerance of some sort, and sometimes they present with vomiting. A key moment here is when the patients present with biliosemesis, 
And that's going to depend on whether the obstruction is proximal or distal to the ampulla. Most of the times, 80% is distal to the ampulla, and some of the patients can present with bilious emesis. So, feed intolerance with emesis then can be bilious. But there are some special cases of partial duty on obstructions that may not present as the ones we described. Let's hear what Dr. Maria said about them. Some patients that present late and not as newborns with duodenal obstruction problems. You have a baby that has done well throughout the first year of life and then parents are, are starting giving some more solid foods and they start having problems. These patients that end up having a, an obstruction is usually from, a, from those wefts, either a windsock or an incomplete uh, membrane. And they present a little later in life once they start solid foods. Uh, the, the evaluation is the same. Awesome. So partial duodenal obstruction usually presents later in life when patients start consuming more solid foods. And now that we have the suspicion for duodenal obstruction, which study we need for doing the diagnose? Some of these patients come with already a, an anatomical diagnosis at the 23-week ultrasound evaluation where it shows a double bubble sign. Half to 60% of them will present with that, but X-ray, abdominal X-ray, which usually shows a double bubble sign. And most cases, that's the only thing you need. If, important to note here that if there's no distal gas in that X-ray, again, you have to rule out acute uh, volvidus. Abdominal X-ray, looking for double bubble sign is your key image to have. But as Dr. Gurria said, if you have any suspicion of a midgut bulbulus, you should use an upper GI. Once you have the diagnosis made, you need to finish the patient's workup. There are some tools we use for an evaluation, which includes, as we talked about, the X-ray, which is uh, an excellent uh, diagnostic tool. Now, for all these patients, you have to perform an echocardiogram to rule out cardiac anomalies, and if there's any present, uh, it has to be evaluated by cardiology as well. For laboratory evaluation, we usually get a fluid blood count, metabolic panel, and coagulation panel as well. If you notice that the patient is, is distended, you can always swap an orogastric or nasogastric tube to decompress right before the repair. So to finish the workup, we will need a white blood cell count, coagulation panel, and metabolic panel. And remember that these patients usually have a hypochloremic and hypokalemic alkalosis, so they will need an IV access for fluid resuscitation. We need to rule out cardiac anomalies with an echocardiogram and cardiology evaluation, and we may need to decompress the stomach with an NG tube. Once we've done that, we are ready for a surgical repair. We have to remember that this is not an, a life-threatening problem. You don't have to rush to the operating room. You have time to make decisions. You have time to evaluate the patient. You have time, importantly, to talk to the family about this. So let's talk about the main goal for the surgery. The main goal is to bypass the obstruction, no matter whether this is an intrinsic compression or any extrinsic compression through a, either a duodenoduodenostomy or a, even a duodenojejunostomy. Not every patient has the appropriate anatomy to perform a perfect diamond-shaped anastomosis. The goal is to perform the anastomosis on the most pendant area uh, to allow emptying. Great. And how do you decide between laparoscopic or open repair? In my practice, any baby that is stable with no compromising heart defect, over two kilograms had to form a laparoscopic Lodina Atricia hair. When you have a baby less than two kilos or they have a heart condition that would not tolerate laparoscopy, an open repair is what you should perform. And how do you usually perform the anastomosis? I use three three millimeter ports. One goes in the belly button, the other one goes in the left upper quadrant, and one goes in the right lower quadrant. Uh, the key part of this operation is that you have to use some sort of stitch to lift up a falciform, and second stitch from the outside to hold the two ends of the duodenum up so you can suture. You have to create the transfer incisions in the upper pouch, which is dilated, and a longitudinal in the lower pouch, and that will create a diamond-shaped anastomosis. I usually cut the duodenum with scissors. I don't use the hook cutter for this. I usually use 5.0 PDS for the anastomosis. In corrupted fashion, I usually do a running stitch, one from the back, one for the front, and then tie them together. 
are there any tricks or things to be aware of when we are doing this anastomosis? Very important move here. You have to perform the duodenotomy on the lateral aspect of the duodenal wall because you do not want to get into the point where you cannot find the ampulla or you get too close. You, you can injure the ampulla really easily. Amazing. So look for the duodenum and find a transition zone. Bypass it with a diamond-shaped anastomosis or at least an anastomosis in the most pendant place and lateral to avoid the ampulla. There is no need neither for a transanastomatic tube nor for a drain. Now, let's hear some tips about the post-operative management. These patients usually get extubated in the operating room, so they're already without an ET tube in the NICU covering. We, the only thing that we use is antibiotics for 24 hours. I usually perform a contrast study on day five uh, to evaluate the anastomosis, and then we start feeds after that. So, now that we cover the surgery itself, let's talk about complications and follow-up. Complications for alino obstruction are coming like two different pieces. One is like the early complications versus the late ones. The early most common is, is a, an asthmatic stricture. It's pretty much technique. Some of the other complications could have, you know, a full anastomotic obstruction, which happens like in two to three percent. Patients can go into congestive heart failure just from the operation, the fluid shifts that happen the first 24 to 36 hours. That happens rarely, but up to like 10 percent. They can have an ileus just from the mobilization of intestine and other, some others like wound infection, which happens rarely. And for late complications, we can have up to 15 percent of post-operative additions. Now that these patients can have, again, this motility, right, and emptying problems from both a dilated stomach and duodenum, and there's some medications that can help with that. What you need to make sure is that you're not having a mechanical problem once you start these promotility agents. So for that, you evaluate with a contrast study. These patients can also have reflux. So if that is the case, you can help with some medications. Perfect. And how often do we do the follow-up consults? These patients, usually we see them at the two-week mark post-op. And then every six months for the first year, you want to make sure these patients are growing, they're achieving their milestones, and they're not having any uh, problems with emptying that could put them at risk for having daisies or their gastric contents or duodenal contents that can get infected. Especially patients with congenital heart disease or trisomy 21, I see them a little more often. Now that we cover all the subtopics, let's summarize. Duodenal obstruction is a common DI anomaly happening in one out of 7,000 newborns. It occurs due to a failure of recanalization of the duodenal lumen and it can be total or partial. The typical presentation is a newborn who has emesis and may present a distended upper abdomen. The diagnosis can be made by an abdominal x-ray with a double bubble sign. Associated anomalies are pretty common, especially cardiac anomalies. So an echocardiogram has to be performed in these patients. The treatment is stabilize the patient and perform an anastomosis to bypass the obstruction. This anastomosis can be done open or laparoscopic and it has to be done in the most pendant place of the proximal portion of the duodenum, in the lateral wall, to avoid damaging the ampulla. After surgery, patients can be extubated, and they have to be put under antibiotics for 24 hours. After five days, a DA track can be performed to see the passage and initiate things. In the follow-up, you have to make sure that patient is growing correctly and achieving its milestones. And that was Duodenal Obstruction with Dr. Juan Gurria. If you like it, leave us a rating or a review. Don't forget to follow us on social media and the YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to download the Stay Current app, where you can find this podcast and more. I'm Cecilia Higiena from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and along with Stay Current, we are sharing knowledge to improve child health around the globe. <music>